Okay, we've already talked about the uh, body versus the laboratory or the inside versus the outside of a rotor wave, wave function and, and involving the, uh, the entire Lie group R3 or uh, U2. Today we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to do it with the smallest non-abelian symmetry, which is the trigonal D3 or C3V. We're going to have a road map like that one of the uh, groups that, e that, e that exist inside crystal symmetry. Uh, but uh, most of the molecules also use those groups. So uh, that's a good thing. But uh, the basic idea is to really understand this is the smallest non-abelian uh, group. Well, it's the same as the C3V as far as a mathematician is concerned. Uh, their, their product relation and structure is identical. But for a physicist, this is very different from this. This one involves reflection planes. This one involves just rotations like D2. Uh, and we want to now uh, take a look at uh, the relationship between reflections and inversion, which would be part of that little project to do the J. Kim Ed uh, thing on D2. And we can carry that to some of the other symmetries uh, as well. And then the slide rule for D3, really simple compared to what we dealt with in the last lecture was the octahedral. So it doesn't hurt to see the simplest example of that. And uh, the idea of doing a non-commutative symmetry expansion using that global local idea that we uh, talked about in the mock mock principle, it's actually much clearer to see this in, uh, uh, making use of this uh, for a small symmetry, the smallest non-abelian symmetry. Now we don't need this uh, business here for commutative groups and we've already done uh, the uh, C6 cyclic group, the C3 cyclic group, C3 subgroup of the one we're going to talk about today. But C6 was a, a formidable symmetry that allowed us to use uh, group parameters that namely the group operators to actually be parameters for a Hamiltonian. We're going to explain how this lets us do that same trick for non-abelian groups, which are the majority, as we'll, as we'll see very shortly here. So once I've um, gotten through uh, this bit here, then we're going to take on the spectral decomposition of this uh, smallest non-abelian group. And we'll learn a little bit of group theory uh, that has to do with uh, cosets and classes, equivalence classes. And then we'll put it together to make a Hamiltonian that uh, is really convenient for discussing vibrations, rotations, stuff we've already done some of. Uh, and uh, that uh, will, will, I think, make sense after we've uh, uh, gone a little bit here. So the first thing uh, to look at uh, is the 32, but I'm first here only showing pictures uh, for 16, and that's kind of um, interesting that of the 32 groups that satisfy their criteria, which we'll just discuss in a little bit, that allow it to be part of a uh, crystal, an infinite crystal in principle, um, includes half abelian, that means half commutative, all the elements commute in an abelian group. And the other half are non-abelian groups, which means some elements do not commute. Usually most elements do not commute in the ones that we'll be uh, talking about. So compare uh, this picture here uh, to uh, what will be coming up here very shortly. Uh, the non-abelian groups are the other 16 uh, that are just have l the letter alphabetic uh, uh, notation for their existence. Uh, the actual pictures of them are shown. So these are two separate uh, figures 
that are in that uh, Principles of Symmetry Dynamics book. So, uh, what, I, what I would like to f uh, first quickly mention is that uh, if you use the character trace formula for vector, uh, that's j equal uh, 1, or 2j plus 1 equal 3, if you just look at the vector uh, representation of the uh, group that we've just finished uh, discussing in some uh, detail, and ask what is the character for a rotation of 2 pi over n, starting, uh, um, say, with uh, uh, n, <coughs> n uh, equal to uh, uh, 2 here, the, uh, just a dihedral uh, thing, or 3, the symmetry that we're going to be working with today, or 4, or, and here's the catch, if you talk about a five-fold symmetry, which is the one we're going to be wanting to go for, for buckyball, um, that's an icosahedral symmetry and has five-fold rotations. And because uh, this character of the vector is not an integer, which it has to be in order to fit in a lattice, uh, it gives the golden ratio, which is the most irrational of numbers, uh, this is a big no. Uh, for a uh, buckyball. It will not make a crystal. Buckminster fullerene is made of a bunch of rolling ball bearings in a face-centered cubic structure. A really remarkable bunch of physics waiting to be explored there. But if you go up to uh, six-fold symmetry, yeah, there's lots of things. Grapha, graphite, with the other, other carbon of high symmetry, uh, there is a lot. But that's the end of the road. You go to seven, eight, nine, ten, anything above six, and you're out of business in three-dimensional space. You can't make a crystal out of it. So there's a quick uh, sort of group theoretical argument uh, for that that's worth uh, uh, remembering. So all of these 32 groups are made out of rotations that are two-fold, three-fold, four-fold, not five-folds, and six-fold. That's all you get to use. Uh, so that's an, uh, a thing to remember. Now, of course, molecules have no trouble uh, as Buckyball has shown us, to make these higher symmetries that don't exist in the crystalline form. So, um, I have included here a population chart, which is also in the same neighborhood of that book uh, that uh, has these other figures. And this is a logarithmic plot of the number of groups. And this is a completely mathematical exercise, which has only recently been brought to completion. We believe now that we know what all the groups are. But for order less than about 64, that's what I've plotted it up to, uh, you can see very clearly on a chart like this, and I'll go ahead to the next uh, slide on this one because that's where it says, it, it is clear that of all of these groups, most of them are non-commutative, that is non-abelian. And also, I would say the vast majority of the groups just in this chart are completely unknown to physicists. So far, they're useless. We're working uh, today with just uh, down here at order six, um, which is the group, uh, order of the group uh, that uh, we'll be uh, um, working with. That is, we're working with uh, C3, V, D3, they're really the same groups as far as a mathematician is, is concerned. So there's a number uh, uh, two uh, uh, sitting there, two kinds of group. One of them is this thing, and then uh, this is of order six uh, over here, that's six right there. The other group is C6, which we already looked at. Okay, so this is also a, 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 six, a six by six matrix. Uh, that we do our Hamiltonian with. Uh, this one is the same as that in, in sort of number, but very different in the algebra that we'll have to do because this guy does not commute, non abelian. Now, for fourfold operations, these guys, this guy right here, C4V and D4, they sort of have the same sort of relation around the number four symmetry as these two do around the number three. So once you've uh, seen how we work with this, uh, it's an interesting problem. Just go ahead and apply what we do today uh, to this pair uh, just to get used to that. 
Now there are quite a number of groups of order eight. Uh, these are just two of them, but they're not distinguished two. They wouldn't be counted as separate. These are counted as one by a mathematician, which is what this chart is uh, aimed at. But there is the quaternion group, and then there are three abelian groups. The dark uh, lines here represent the number of abelian groups, and the number is actually written in there. There are three of them there. there the, there's, uh, um, <clears throat> there's C8, there's C4 cross C2, and there's C2 cross C2 cross C2, which is the D2H uh, that we would like to do something with. So. Um, all three of those are different, mathematically different, uh, abelian groups. And then comes our friend uh, D4 and C4V, all counted as one, and then there is the quaternion group, which is not abelian either. So we, we kind of feel pretty comfortable with the groups that are about up to here. Now the octahedral group is the one we talked about before. There's 15 groups of order 24 that are not abelian, but only three abelian. Remember, this is a log chart here, okay? Okay, so that gives you an idea of the territory that we're working with as we study uh, finite symmetries. Okay, it's quite a bit different. Uh, it's a much richer structure hiding in the group O3, uh, the subgroups of the a group O3 already huge, but there's a lot more that doesn't get fill uh, that category at all. So, as I say, uh, physicists have a lot to learn about this stuff. Now, uh, here's the symmetry of a D. All D groups are propellers, basically uh, 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 equal pro propellers, a balanced propeller that you could use in a bar to cool the customers uh, from the ceiling down, blowing air down on the customer. Okay, and very typically, uh, that's the number that's chosen. And it's kind of neat because that, that, that propeller thing can be installed uh, on the shaft that's always turning the same direction. And no matter whether I install it this way or turn it over, install it, same thing. It's still going to blow the air down on the customers. That's something to uh, think about and be aware of the symmetry. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the, the three of the elements are just 180 degree rotations around the ends of the blade. Now this one is isomorphic, and we can show that fairly quickly here, uh, to this one where the three operations that we work with are sigmas, reflections. Okay, And what we need to do, uh, I'll go ahead on this screen here and put this one up there and then we'll talk about it uh, on this screen uh, more. What we need to do is make a relationship between um, this particular operation here. Or let's just look at this one because it's straight up reflection through the x, z plane. Y is uh, of the axis up in the air there. That's giving us C3V. Uh, this is D3 over here. And this uh, reflection, you see, uh, goes with this 180 degree rotation in a funny kind of way. If I multiply that by an inversion, I get this. So let's look at that first. The group slide rule, I think you already see how that works. But I want to make a comparison between 180 degree rotation in the XYZ coordinates where we're, we're talking about uh, this axis, the Y axis, which is up here, uh, being the one that doesn't change when you do a 180 degree rotation around it, this thing over here has a, a plane that is immune to a reflection number three. This is rotation number three. Uh, this is reflection number three. And it is just I times this one. So that is uh, something we need to uh, keep in mind here. Mirror plane reflection is equal to 180 degree rotation around an axis perpendicular to the mirror times inversion. Inversion is this guy. And this is just a unit matrix multiplied by minus 1. So you know it's going to commute with everything. But the other operators we talk about here do not commute. Uh, They're not the diagonal uh, here. Uh, that matrix is a 
180 degree rotation about the C axis, right? About the middle axis, oh, okay. which is Y. Okay, it, yeah, yeah, I've got Z pointing the way it points at argon. The Z axis is on the, on the horizon, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Now, all accelerators and lasers, everything we do that moves something is uh, laying down. The Z axis is laying down in the physics lab, right? In the math lab, it's always <laughs> up, right? So that's what probably was tripping you off there. So <laughs> uh, important to realize that it's the Y that this thing is being talked about, right? So it turns X and Z into minus one, right? That's what we we're, were playing with that yesterday, right? Okay. Well, this one is just the opposite. The uh, Y gets flipped. The other two don't get moved at all. Dr. Hunter, just a question. So here you have a, a node that says isomorphic means mathematically the same abstract group. Does that mean yeah. that uh, if if two groups are isomorphic, then they'll have the same character table too? Uh, They're going to have virtually all the mathematical properties that we derive that are purely mathematical. They will be, the, the, there's no reason that, that the mathematician would distinguish them. You just say, oh, it's different notation. It's the algebra is the But the physicist, the physicist, kind of, it's very different, these two. The right? algebra is the same because the character table is the same. Yeah, yeah this, this can have all of the same numbers, mathematical numbers, right? But it's very different, right? This one I can do without breaking. All of the other operations here I can do, as I say, I can take that fan off, flip it over and put it back up, it'll work just as well. Okay? But if I take the fan down and smash it into pieces and put all the pieces uh, on the other side of the mirror, I just have sawdust and it's not going to work. So physicist, very different. Mathematician, identical. The good distinction to be aware of. There's a lot of, of that uh, in this subject. Okay? So this is an important uh, connection here. And that's what really makes uh, these things isomorphic. You see, the aversion commutes with all of the rotations, no matter how much they commute or don't commute with each other. Okay, row two here. Perpendicular row two, mirror plane reflection. Okay, that these, these are connected. You see, row two, sigma two, mathematically, they're the same uh, for the uh, group structure. Same with row one. So row three, row two, and row one uh, each has uh, a plane that is perpendicular to its corresponding rotation. So this plane is, is perpendicular to this one. And this plane uh, down here, and I'm too close to see it, but it's, it's perpendicular to that axis. Okay. So that's the thing that really makes it so these things so a product over here, row one, row two, will map onto a product sigma one, sigma two. Well, that'll be nothing but row one times row two with two i's. But i squared is one, so it disappears. So there's your proof that this is uh, having the same product structure, at, uh, each of these two uh, uh, groups. The rows and the sigmas don't look different to a mathematician that's just interested in the group structure. Okay, so each of this, is involving the uh, rotation around this axis, uh, they're, they're also going to be obeying the same things. But the quickest way to see this is just to go ahead and look at the group slide rule. Okay, so here I am putting down the letters on this uh, little diagram, the little triangles that, that hold uh, and uh, they're sort of uh, faded out in that picture because I'm just interested in doing a particular one of them. So the, the idea is that you uh, find a product here by considering a state equation. That's the trick that we used yesterday uh, to make all of the octahedral, or I should say uh, two days ago, all of the octahedral operations. Okay? And it's based on the fact that when you have a product left is last. You read from the right to the left. So this is going to act first if I just forget about the vectors here. This is going to act second for all of the operations that we uh, do. And that's going to be part of our duality. We're going to have operations that go the other way. That's the inside job that we need to talk about in the mock-mock principle. 
that's coming out here. Okay, so all these other things come from the graph, uh, the slide rule, uh, to make this table. And that table is the same except for changing rho to sigma for these groups. So that, that really nails it right there when you show, show that. Okay, so the mathematicians say, just notation, right? But the physicist said, uh -uh. <laughs> Okay, all right, so let's uh, talk about equivalence transformations real quick. This is, again, review of stuff that we did last time with O. So much simpler here because we only have six elements. And the rotating uh, row three here, uh, <clears throat> or the sigma three, either one, okay, Right now I'm looking at D3, okay, uh, would take us, uh, uh, <clears throat> that, that is, uh, using uh, the 120 degree rotation, say that one right there, it goes like that, uh, that would take this axis, if I did it to the machinery that does the group uh, uh, multiplications, take me down to here, okay. And that would seem to indicate, and this is what you would know if you were doing, um, thinking of these things as operators, if I'm going to do this transformation on an operator, I've got to do it fore and aft. I've got to do it on the kets and the bras. And the bras take an inverse. So it's a similarity transformation is what it is. And it's the similarity of these two uh, operators, one that we start with and the one that we end with. And you have to, of course, check your multiplication. Uh, with a table or with a slide rule and see that this checks out, okay, and I'll let you do that on your on your own time And here's another example Okay, so we're going to make a lot of use of this similarity <coughs> transformation in particular We're interested in the elements that uh, Play with each other through a similarity transformation the similarity classes equivalence classes We've got to do that uh, in order to get the uh, non-abelian groups to be nice to us instead of being uh, uh, obscure. So here's where we play uh, a game, the mock-mock principle game. Uh, in order to take non-commutative symmetry and use it as efficiently as you could do with the commutative symmetries like the cyclic groups or the D2 or uh, there are a lot of, of groups on that table that are abelian. As I said, that was 32. 16 of them are abelian. I don't need what we're about to talk about, but for the other 16, I really need to change things. Because here's the situation. We found a way uh, to write a Hamiltonian as a linear combination of, in the case of the cyclic groups, r to some power. So this is really just Fourier analysis, and commutivity is not an issue. They always commute with each other because the exponents add, and add, add, addition is a commutative operation, okay? But this is not the case for the groups that we're about to embark on right now. What we need to learn now is how to do that trick of writing a Hamiltonian in terms of its group with operators that do not commute. Well, while the symmetry operations do, in order to be symmetry operations, commute with the Hamiltonian, they do not mostly commute with each other. So it looks like we're out of, out of business here. How do you write a, a, a Hamiltonian in terms of non-commutative matrices? That's the trick. Spectrally decomposed. Pardon? Spectrally decomposed. I guess I... Spectrally decomposed the Well, Hamiltonian. in order to do the spectral decomposing cleanly, how do you write the things? That, that would be another way uh, to do it. So the question is, how do you do spectral decomposition like we did up here, down here? That's what, uh, we have to answer that right away. So, once again, I want to make sure that you understand the mock mock principle. And this is a duality relativity that goes a whole bunch of names that I think of. Von Vleck, most recently, Kashmir, before him, the Kashmir operator for group theory is well known. Mach is the one that really was rattling Newton's cage. But then there's Archimedes who says, well, I've got to have a place to stand or I can't move anything. So, so Always some relativity in this. 
So is the motivation to express H in terms of non-commuting groups uh, to, to study the molecules, like you want to write the Hamiltonian of the molecule in terms of the groups which characterize yes. the symmetry of the molecule? Yes. Okay. Yeah, how do you pull that off when uh, the group you're talking about doesn't, isn't commutative, you see? We do need some kind of commutation to pull that off, right? In other words, to find a, a, a bunch of things uh, that have the same eigenvectors, in order for that to happen, commutivity is required. You, in order to get matrix diagonal form. Diagonal matrices commute really nicely, don't they? Just multiplying two times four or four times two. <laughs> Both eight, right? Well, we gotta, we gotta pull a trick here. And the trick here is to not just work with something that's based to the outside, but also consider operators that are based on the inside. They're both going to do the same kind of thing. It's just sort of backwards for this one to this one. And the way that works out is, first of all, because they're independent and entangled, this one is a busy moving the universe. That's the prosaic way I described this thing, which is uh, going to come down to Earth off of this. Uh, or you're moving this object that's inside there. The objects are disentangled in a funny kind of way, but in, in another kind of way, they're very entangled, and that's a, a, what we're trying to quantify here. So I do need this mock mock relativity principle. I just mean that if I apply an R operation uh, to this thing, I will get the same relative position as if they apply their R inverse operation. That doesn't mean these two are equal by any means. They're only equal in their effect on one vector. There's got to be an original state. And in our case, the Euler angles, when they're equal to zero, that's the original state. That's the or number one state, you might say. But it, origin is probably uh, a better word for it. It says, uh, when we count like C, we count from zero. Okay, so there is an origin to that. So. The question then is, how do you actually make these operators? Now, it, it, now we got to put up or shut up. Okay, we could easily say we had lab and we had body and go ahead and do calculations, but where are those guys? I mean, this one seems like a very ephemeral and maybe non-existent uh, idea. That's about to end here. So what we need to do is do it with matrices. So we start off here with, and here I have a different notation uh, that we're going to use a lot um, of, uh, of here. Instead of the rows that, that were the uh, rotators, 180 degree rotators, I'm using the eyes that we used in the octahedral. So this is a better for us to connect to the this is a, a subgroup. Uh, actually, there's several of these subgroups in the octahedral group. Okay, there were eight different three-dimensional, three-fold rotations. You see, so there's quite a few uh, subgroups awaiting, uh, and uh, there are four to be the exact uh, number because there's two-sided axis. So um, we're going to. Uh, you know, think about a system like this, and we're going to try to write a Hamiltonian for a three potential well um, quantum problem, the simplest uh, non abelian quantum mechanical problem. And uh, the wave that we get is shown uh, over there on the far screen, and we're going to talk about how we get that, what its symmetry is, both inside and out. We're going to have lab and body stuff here. So we start off with just the lab fixed operations. And a typical one would be that I2, that's this 180 degree rotation here, is going to take the state 1, and we're just going to call that particular one above the x-axis state 1. That I2 would take that and it's going to roll it up and put it over here. So that's a typical operation uh, of the results from doing a, a, a laboratory uh, flip. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to really show a lot of these diagrams uh, fully, but I don't need to do that. Uh, I think we've got enough 
uh, you have enough faith in me that we can just do something here with matrices uh, that makes this work. So here's the deal. Here's the group table. And it's a very special group table in which I've put the inverse of the order that we're used to, 1, R, R squared, I, 1, 2, and 3, the, the inverse of that is up here. Well, these guys have their own inverses, so they don't uh, change at all. But these two flip. R2 and R are inverse of each other. Okay? So uh, by doing that, I get the unit operator on the diagonal. Remember, that's what we did with C6 to do the Fourier analysis of C6 with the C6 group. Okay? So, can we just proceed with that? Well, no, we can't write the Hamiltonian in terms of these things because these guys all don't commute with each other, pr 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 pretty much. About the only ones I can imagine here that commute with each other is this one with itself. <laughs> but then they all commute with themselves, right? Okay, so definitely these guys don't commute with each other. They don't commute with this one. So this is totally non-commutative, terrible thing. We, we're out of business, you see as far as this uh, uh, group theory, uh, uh, high-level group theory is. But this isn't the only way to write this table that gives you ones on the diagonal. What I can do, now be, be aware of what I'm doing here. I've, I've noticed I've circled the I3 here, so the representation of I3 is just wherever you see an I3. And then for I2, wherever you see an I2, like there, that's where you put the ones. I, I want to make sure that's clear, right? That's what we did with C6, right? We're doing it now, but there's another way to do it. That's this way. This time I'll put the inverses on this side and leave these in the right order. That's the only difference. New set of matrices. These are, uh, except for this one, all different, okay? In a funny kind of way, it's not easy to see right away how, how are they different. This one doesn't seem to be related at all to that one. This one kind of, but no. Uh, it's got some weird stuff. It jumps down to, I mean, that, that's it. But what is true about these two, and you can try this on your own, any of these commutes with any of these, or every one of these. A better way to state it, because this is the one we're going to make, use to make the Hamiltonian. Every one of these commutes with this one, and 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 of course this one. Everybody commutes an identity, right? So that is really cool. That, that, you're going to have to check me on this, but it's true. So this is how you make that inside set of operators. Now you can call these the inside, because if you're, if you're living on the inside, you call them the inside, right? They're the others, right? This is an exercise in diversity. Uh, Dr. Harder, so that character table... So that's not a character table. This is a product table. Product table, yeah. And it's giving us these matrices. And then this product table, which is essentially the same product table, is giving these. And they come in. Every one of those commutes. Every one of those. So, for example, like one, two, three, four. So the fourth row and the fifth row. Uh, I mean, in the product table, uh, you interchange those. Yeah. Oh, not that those simple. Arrows? It's not that simple. We'll talk about that later. Let me proceed just with this. And the, the, this particular discussion uh, goes on uh, for uh, two to three lectures in the uh, group theory course. What we're trying is to pare that down. Just by jumping right now, we'll come back to it. We can go all the way to the end in one lecture. <laughs> that's, that's what we're trying to do. It's trying to streamline. So I'm going to skip for one, once in this course. I'm going to say, hold on on that question. Hold that thought. Uh, we're going to just take this uh, at face value. Now you can go ahead uh, on your own. I mean, yeah, because what I see from there is like they are not just switched because the ones would be in, a different, in different places. Yeah, 
they're in very different places. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. That that's my question. That's what throwing me really off is that yeah. I don't see that. Yeah. 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 That's it. That's absolutely. Yes. Now, given this, as I've already uh, said here, the H matrix, which, if it has the global symmetry that that that, that, we, that we're talking about here, then these guys, these local guys, compute uh, with uh, the, this collection any numbers, any of those parameters uh, I can take. And it will still commute with these the symmetry operators. So that's the way uh, we're getting we're g getting to do a Fourier analysis in a non-abelian environment. Okay, and I'll say it a couple of different ways here. What we're seeing here is one, two, three, four, five, six parameters, but it's actually seven if you count. The fact uh, that these can be complex turns out these have to be uh, real, and these have to be the complex conjugate of each other. So it really comes to uh, six parameters that you really use. This guy's kind of lazy; uh, he just sits on the diagonal and uh, makes the whole thing go up or down. But th this is a complete set. That's what I'm really uh, trying to sell here. These these parameters that uh, we have here. Uh, <clears throat> As I say, all, first of all, all of the glow will commute with any uh, thing made of local operators, and that's what we uh, definitely want to do. So what we're getting here, and this is really powerful, is a complete set of D3 coupling or tunneling parameters labeled by the group elements. I'm using the same notation. And then I'm showing you a picture of where they tunnel to or where they couple to, you see. R2 couples to R squared. I sub 1 couples to the uh, rotation uh, uh, I1. It takes, uh, uh, as you can see, I1 would flip 1 over to here. So that's the state I1. So we're labeling the states with the groups that we've already done before a couple of times. Uh, but now we're saying, hey, we're also going to label all of the tunneling paths to get to those states uh, with things that are uh, using the same sort of symbol uh, for each of the group operators. So we're, tr we're looking for an orthocomplete description of all possible symmetries and all possible solutions to all possible symmetries that have D3 as their underlying uh, symmetry group. That's what we're after. And we had that with the uh, Fourier analysis. Fourier analysis back and forth. No problem. Count the parameters kind of like we count them here. You have to be careful with complex conjugates and stuff like that. If you want to have Hermitian uh, quantum mechanics, but if you don't want to have that, you can have scattering theory. You can have S matrices with a lot more parameters usually. Okay, so one of the things that we have to do, and this is very old and not uh, uh, at all um, required by uh, what we just did, this is something that's true whether we do global local stuff or not. Here's the group table for D3 that's been there uh, at least 120, maybe 150 years. Uh, not necessarily this notation, but D3 has survived uh, many wars. And uh, what we do here is we say, hey, all these guys that look the same, that is 180 degree rotations around a triangle, or, or these guys, 120 degree erosions, either from the top or the bottom, uh, they make up equivalence class, and uh, equivalence classes have an interesting commutation property of their own. It, it, and, and so I say this is a very old uh, idea of the equivalence uh, in groups. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add them and call them capitals for class. I, K is kind of a sound, so class uh, and kappa kind of go together here. And uh, each one of these sums is invariant to the, uh, 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 the whole group. That is, uh, they commute with every element. Each one of these classes commutes with any of the elements. Uh, or for any uh, group operator, uh, it will commute with any of the classes. So. That's what we have to work with right here. Some very old stuff and some old 
kind of old notation. I've only seen this in one place, and I use it all the time. Whenever I want to count the number of elements of something, I put order as a degree symbol on the left-hand upper side there. So the order of this group is six. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, but the uh, order of a class uh, that's quite different. The class of the unit, the unit is in a class by itself. Okay, so it has only one element. But the number of elements in this class is two, and the number of elements in the 180 degree class, the I class, as opposed to the R class, is one more, it's three. So those are key numbers, okay? And they're going to uh, play a role that's rather important here. So the basic idea is if you do a similarity transformation of a class sum, you get it back again. It just shuffles the uh, elements. Doesn't introduce new ones or destroy old. Uh, uh, old ones, okay? And so you end up with a sum here uh, to the order of that particular class as, a, as an interesting algebraic operation. Yeah. So the key here, your kappa is a matrix, right? You're representing the group as a matrix, right? Well, we eventually will, but not here. Here oh. we're just going to treat it as an algebraic element. Okay. Okay, obviously we could just use the matrix we got from the whole table and represent, but that's kind of a waste of time because you're doing six by six for just something that uh, there's three things to play with. Turns out you can make a matrix out of that, but that's also a little bit clumsy. Doesn't, these things don't have inverses, or, you know, they don't have clean inverses, okay, that we can write down. Now, here, here is something that we need to do just for the single element, the single group element has a self-symmetry. That is, it has a certain number of elements, O, S, K, G, K does, uh, that commute with it. Okay, self-commuting we're talking about here. Okay, for example, element one, wow, does it have a big self-symmetry. Everybody commutes with one, right? Okay, but you go on to R here, uh, he doesn't commute at all with these damn eyes. He doesn't have anything to do. Does commute with that. And R commutes with R squared. Okay? So the order of the self symmetry for each of the R's is three. Half of what the unit has. Okay? He only can do the front half of the group. That's C3. That's an abelian group, but this is not abelian, right? Now, how many elements commute with these buggers, these, these non-commuters, right? Is it one? No, because I squared is one, and that makes I commutes with itself, and it commutes with the thing that commutes with everybody. So the answer to that one is two. Okay, so these are key numbers for uh, some uh, stuff that we're going to uh, be doing right here. Okay. This is an integer count of D3 operators that commute uh, with GK. That's, that's a key number. And this ratio is important. The ratio of that to the order of the group, 6. Okay? Now what's interesting is this is always an integer. And we can, we can show that. So just that we need a few pages now of real group theory. This is actual group theory that you get in a group theory class that had no physicist in it. And, and we're going to apply this. Uh, a key integer ratio and sort of prove uh, what we've uh, already said is that it always is an integer. Uh, that is, I think, an important uh, uh, point here. Okay, so each of these groups forms a self-symmetry group. Okay, each GS transforms um, uh, GK into itself. Okay, that's the idea of the self-symmetry. The green guys here uh, taking GK right into GK. Okay. Now, each one of those uh, GK uh, that's not in the self-symmetry, say an operator GT, that uh, it will transform GK into a different element, GK prime, of its class, by definition of its class. And if it does that, then so does G times any element in the self-symmetry. And you can prove that very quickly. Just put these uh, two in here. Okay, this is another uh, element that's uh, uh, in what's called a coset of uh, the self-symmetry uh, subgroup. 
And uh, then I have here this uh, inverse of GTGS. Well, you should know that when you do an inverse, you flip them. Okay, and that's part of the reason wh wh why we're doing our mock. Mock is, is right, uh, that little flipper roo right there. But um, uh, now you have the GS working on GK, and it collapses to GK, so GK prime is uh, just a, a, a member of the coset. Uh, that we can make. So these are called left cosets when you take a subgroup and then multiply it by something uh, a, a, a G2, GT like that or a G, another, find another one and so on and so on. You just keep going and each time you get another set of elements that are completely different from the ones you've gotten already. And pretty soon you exhaust the group. And so that means that these uh, subgroups all have to have uh, an order that divides the order of the group. That's Lagrange's first theorem, but this is proving us a lot more here. This is also, this is the idea here, the order of the group is equal to the order of cell symmetry times the order of the class that goes with it. It divides it evenly into subsets of each other. So the result is that this the ratio of the order of the class also has to be an integer and is the order of the cell symmetry. That is cool. Is, is it the same Lagrange who developed the Mechanics done. <laughs> okay. These guys worked overtime. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, the brother, I just have a question. So, if a molecule doesn't have uh, the exact symmetry that these groups have, can you still approximate it and then uh, mm -hmm. do some corrections? That, that's, I mean, that's a very practical question, and the answer mm -hmm. is yes and yes again. Um, the idea really is to take something that doesn't have quite the symmetry and assume it does have a symmetry, work it out, and then try to do little perturbations, which the symmetry will help you do, and incidentally, um, very profitable to do, to do that, yeah, to look at things that aren't perfect. Yeah, that form of yeah. measure of how close they are to a given yeah, set is rather big. If you can even make it quantitative, look that's really papers. an accomplishment. It's a big topic. Okay, so let, let's uh, go here. Now that we know that this um, collection of things into uh, classes like that, and, and, uh, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into um, an algebra that uh, has these kappas, okay? Now, that's just a trivial step right there, but then there's K2, which is the sum of these two guys, and then there's K3, which is some of these three guys, and if you multiply them out, you get an algebra that looks like this, okay? Uh, the square of K2 comes out to 2 times the end entity plus K2. Uh, you multiply uh, K2 by K3, okay? So here's K2, you multiply it by K3, what do you get? You get one, two of those, one, two of those, and one, two of those. So you get two times the third class So, Okay, so very quickly you turn this group table into a multiplication table for the class algebra. Or a ring, a ring. This is a, sometimes called a ring. I mean, you might have heard that in mathematicians, yeah. right? Uh, so, well, that's powerful because I can diagonalize everything. There, they're all commuting, see? It's the same thing. Okay? These guys all commute. So this was, you know, a, a, a wonderful, um, shall we say, breakthrough in the sense of being able to diagonalize group or reduce group operators. Not completely diagonalized, but they all don't commute. But these do commute. So we can do uh, this, this mutually all commuting operators. That's what they are. They commute with everything in the group. Okay? Kind of like our, our uh, inside jobs, except there's only three of these. All right? So, and remember, the order of the class must evenly divide the order of the group. So when you uh, do a sum over all the transformations of a single element, you will get this number, which is the ratio of G to the order of the class. That has to be an integer. Uh, that's kind of cool. That's the Lagrange theorem. That's the Lagrange theorem. So there is 
I don't know if I if I am recalling wrong, but there is another theorem that says like the the order of a non-commuting abelian class divides the order of e the groups yeah, that what is you're doing in here. But that's on a special case of the Lagrange. Because well, the first Lagrange, Lagrange theorem, I would say, was probably, and this is one that most people get taught, they don't get to this one, the course that I saw over here, the, la the, like the uh, subgroups yeah, evenly yeah, divide. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the, an special case of the Lagrange theorem, right? Because I mm -hmm. think like the Lagrange theorem says uh, the, the order of the classes divides the group. The that's group. the second. The, or, the, orders, the order of, of a subgroup. Group. Yeah. The order of a subgroup of a group divides the, the if it is cyclic. I think. It's an integer. Yep. Yep. That just means you can't have fractional cosets. Yeah, I'm. Tr I, I'm just <laughs> trying to pair up. It's the before. same machinery in operation. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's the same machinery. Slightly different. Okay. So, once you have an algebra, cool. you can write polynomials, right? And uh -huh. make projection operators. That's what we're going to do now. And this one is particularly cool down here because that guy, uh, that K3, uh, it gives us three non-equal roots. So I can completely get the projection operators out of that one. But maybe I start with this one, I get two projectors out of this one because it has a degeneracy, uh, which I, I think you'll see. Um, this thing has a minus two and a plus one, but this one has a minus three, a plus three, and a zero. Okay, this one has a the um, <coughs> one and minus two, and that's all one of those is degenerate. So um, the uh, idea is to use that. Okay? How how are you making those uh, class products? See, this is is, is the factorization uh -huh. of the K three cubed equation which is 9K3, so there's a, an equation just involves K3, this third class sum, and obeys a cubic equation with three different roots. And that's all we need. We just need to get three projectors. The A1, A2, and E is uh, what they're going to be named. Remember that we had in an octahedral group an A1 and an A2 and an E, right? Same deal. They, they're related. <laughs> in a distant sort of way. So and that's what we need to do. And then do another one in that Here, Here's the first projector. Remember how you, you throw away one of the factors from this, okay? And you will get an eigen equation. K3 PA is plus 3. That's this root right here that you threw away. See? <laughs> Remember, that was our... our, our that's Sylvester's death, uh, theorem, I guess, uh, kind of, the thing that's over in the far right, uh, far I, left corner up I, there. Yeah, I remember like doing the computations when I took like, group theory, but I mean, I, like, I really, I mean, I have to be honest, I really did not understand <laughs> The reason. Yeah. Now you're going to. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. did the computation, and I'm like, well, it seems intuitive, so I will do it, and I got it. Yeah. But the, the reason, like the real reason, I didn't. So now, once you've thrown different. this thing away, mm -hmm. that's the projection operator, just divide by the differences. Oh. Right? Okay, that's the projection operator. Remember, that's the Sylvester formula. Wait, right wait, there. yeah, that's like the big bias formula. Oh, yeah. I remember that's now. <laughs> yep. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, yeah, it does. It yeah. does. It does make sense. But we're only a third of the way done. But that's just like taking like a secular yeah. equation and now throw this one out and then replacing that one that solved the equation. Yeah. Now throw that one out. Get this this uh, collection right. Uh, of course, you have to divide by the eigenvalue differences that are appropriate for this. Okay. So this is a projector whose eigenvalue is minus three. That's this root right here. We already got one for three, now we got one for minus three. So we got the pair, okay? And we still have to do the, bone the last bone. guy right here by throwing away uh, the last guy, okay? So there's PE down there. It's got the plus root and the minus root, and then subtracting that from the eigenvalue of zero, which is what we get uh, for that particular element. Uh, so. We're in like Flynn, as they uh, say in the White House now. No, they don't say that at all, do they? Tried He's to. out. He's got. Well, they tried to. Okay, so um, 
you might notice that this guy has two roots, okay, two and two uh, for uh, that guy, uh, but this one also. So there's a degeneracy there that doesn't hurt us here. We don't do anything with it. We got all the information we need uh, from that. But the KR does have an eigenvalue of two and one. But what I'm doing here is I'm saying, hey, the unit operator should spectrally uh, decompose into a sum of all of the uh, projectors, and that indeed is the case. Uh, if you go ahead and write these things out, sum them up, uh, you get to see that uh, fairly quickly. Okay. So, the all commuting projectors is what we're getting from uh, all of this, okay? The first one, okay, this guy up here, okay, k squared 3 for 3k. Go up here and see what k squared is. k3 squared is this, so I get that 3k plus 1 plus 2 plus the 3k here. Oh, I, I recognize that right away. That's exactly what I would get if I summed all of these guys up. I would get 1 plus 2 plus 3, that's 6 of PA. Then these cancel, okay? Minus 3 plus 2 plus 1, 0. 1 minus 1, 0. Okay, so when I sum them all up, uh, that is uh, an, easy, an easy one, okay? This is our identity uh, representation uh, of the uh, group sitting right there, okay, with its coefficients. Then this one, I go ahead and uh, take, take this one apart right here write it all out, okay? Plunk it down here. And then expand each one of these uh, class sums into the group elements that we're dealing with. Th this is the last one. This is the one that really does the work for this group. The other two are uh, very simple. So, uh, we have just arrived in an elegant fashion the character table of this group. Remember how we got it yesterday? Or I mean, the last, last lecture? We got the big uh, R3 group to give us a, t a vector and a tensor, right? And then we got some matrices from that and we took the trace. Very different procedures for getting that. And we did it with a big group. This procedure it takes quite a while uh, with O, as, as you'll see. If we, uh, we'll, we'll sketch that out uh, later on, just so you can uh, see many ways to get it. But this is what we're after. That's the character table. And where do you see the numbers? Right here with the coefficients 1, 1, 2. 1, 1, minus 1, and 1, minus 1. 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1. I'm cheating a little bit here. How did I know to factor out a third from this one and a sixth from this one? Okay. That's a little bit of a trick, okay, uh, to get that, okay? And I want to point out that you find it by realizing that the character of the unit, that guy who uh, commutes with everything, is the dimension of the irreducible representation. So you get that first by simply solving the equation L alpha squared divided by the order of the group, that's 6, uh, is equal to two-thirds. By solving that, I get the L equal two that goes right here. So this is the doubly degenerate irreducible representation, just like it was in the, remember when I held my fingers up like this for two? The E is two. Uh, it's the same two uh, for the octahedral group that we got with some difficulty using tensor matrices. But it was fast, it was quick. And uh, we, uh, we like quick. Now, these are uh, formulas. These are the general formulas involving the order of the class, the dimension of the representation, and the trace of the irreducible representation, which is the numbers we're uh, putting in the table uh, that's called the character table uh, for this uh, group. So, okay. Well, let's, let's get going here. I want to show you something that this, this stunned a lot of my friends. Uh, in, in, um, in molecular physics who, who fashion group theory uh, 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 as at least 50% of their work. Yeah. Can you go back one slide? Yes, yes. Back one from there? Yeah, there. Yes. Yeah, so uh, how did you make those polynomials again? That's not clear to me, like the k3 power 3 mm -hmm. minus 9k3. Oh, this guy right here? No, no, no. Oh. Uh, Characteristic equation. Oh. 
How, how, oh, uh, way up here. The there. Characteristic equation. Uh, the equation, the cubic the equation. The, the cubic bottom. equation. The next line, the cubic equation. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. Oh, well, this this one right here. How did you how did you build it up from well, that table? Well, here's k three squared. Now multiply by another k three. So I have to add in uh, k one k three. That's this guy right here. Okay, that's another. It's a k three, three of those. right? So when I add that in, that's what I get. I get the K3 cubed is nine times K3. Just by putting it, doing another K3 product here, uh, I get K3 times K1, that's K3 squared. Of, uh, that's what I'd be doing, that's what I'm writing right there, it's K3 squared. Oops, All I have to do is put head. another K3 onto that. Okay, what's K3 times uh, uh, K1? Well, that's just K3, okay? What's K3 times K2? Okay, K2 times K3? It's 2 times K3. 2 plus 1 is 3. And then it's multiplied by 3, so I get 9. Does that make sense? I mean, so I'm sorry, right. I just passed over that pretty quickly there, but it, that's what you get. Some, some operations here. Yeah. K, K3 cubed is, is 9K3. Yeah. And that's what you're looking for when you want to make a polynomial to give you projection operators, right? Yes. And that's a, that's a hard part for some of the groups, is, is that when you get down to the bottom of this thing, you've got to do it again and again and I'll separate them. Yeah. interject here since you have a question on this. You can build a characteristic equation using k kappa sub 2 to but solve that. But it's got two roots that are the same. You see, when you have that, you can't, you can't, so you know, it's not the, the idempotent that goes with the sum of those guys is an idempotent, but it's not an irreducible one. You still have to split that too. So, so that's why it's really nice to have an operator, a K3, uh, that has all different uh, roots. Because then you're guaranteed the projection operators that you see there, there, there. Oh, so you're saying you'd have a second order equation from yeah. that instead of a full three? The, the minimal equation is second order. For the right. Kappa sub two. Yeah. Okay. This the good point. I mean, that, that's, that's the fly that makes it, it much harder to get the, traject the uh, uh, characters for the octahedral group than the way we did it. The elegant method isn't so elegant when you have to separate equations that aren't minimal equations. You see, you're trying to minimize the minimal equations. Mm -hmm. And th that takes a little bit of al algebra. Now, if we could discover an easy way to do that, maybe we could uh, take on some really big groups. But um, right now, I don't see a way uh, around that. Now, this is the thing. These, these numbers here are so cool. <clears throat> uh, first of all, let's start from the bottom. This is what's usually called the Diophantine group equation. And that is that the order of the group is the sum of the squares of the character table dimension. That is the sum of the squares of these. Now there's a really good reason for that. Is that once you understand uh, today how we split these things, it will be obvious. But um, 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 2 squared is definitely 6, the mm -hmm. order of this group. So. Uh, I might as well go to the next one where these are all written out. Order of D3 is 6, sum of the squares. What's really cool, and this is not, I find, in, in uh, group theory books, is the sum of the dimensions. Not the square of them, but the sum of them. Just sum them. Okay? 1 plus 1 plus 2. 2 plus 2 equal four, right? And just then the dean walks by and says, what are we paying for you to teach people two plus two is four? <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> okay, but this is cool. Because what this is giving us is the number of mutually commuting operators, the maximal number. And it's the number of irreducible item potents too. That's what we're going to be getting in short order here. 
but the number of mutually commuting operators that you can find out of this collection of algebraic elements in an infinite, six infinite dimensional space is just four. That's all you can find in there that will uh, make a little collection of algebraic elements commute with each other. We already know um, what are the um, all, number of all commuting operators. How many operators in there, and it's got to be less than four, okay? How many operators in there commute with everything? I call it the centrum number. This is should be called the rank, and it is in Lie algebras, but not in group theory, apparently. But anyway, the, number, the sum over all of the dimensions to the zeroth power is 1 plus 1 plus 1. It's just the number of classes. This is the number of classes. But it's also the number of all commuting operators. They're only, no matter how you arrange this thing, uh, you only have three operators that commute with everything. But you have four that commute with themselves. Okay? So, this one's a democracy, this one's an oligarchy. That's an oligarchy. Okay, for this group. Okay? So, that's what we're going to use. We're going to use that right, right now. And we're also going to use the fact that D3 has a number of subgroups. One of them is C3. The other one, which is indicated and I've outlined in red, are the C2 groups that involve those eyes, those 180 degree rotations. So we're going to make use of these lines here as we go through uh, various symmetries that we need for um, the molecules that we know and love. But uh, that's the, the key things here. So, what we've got here is a projection operator that is 1 plus 1 plus 1 divided by 6, sum of classes. Okay? And then we get another projection operator that's pretty much the same, it's to put some minus sign. So this is a scalar, this is a pseudo-scalar, sometimes the name is given to uh, A2 uh, representations. But E here is actual two-dimensional set of matrices. But it is a combination just of two times this, plus minus one uh, times that. Okay? Now what we have to do is square this thing up, that is make a correlation with this table and the one we know and love from C2. C2's character table is just even and odd. 0 mod 2 and 1 mod 2 in, in binary notation. So this is qubit. This is your qubit uh, table. Okay? Just for one element, I3. Now, I could do it with I2. I could do it with I1. This is where you make a choice. Who's going to be diagonal? I can't make a diagonal uh, for all of these. I can't even make a diagonal for any two of these. I can only do one. So kind of like the way you pick the angular momentum Z to be the, the diagonal matrix in your algebra of O3 or R3, I'm going to pick the third uh, one to be uh, the, the lucky one that gets to be diagonal. The other two will then not be diagonal. Okay? And neither will these. So this is a big choice right here. This is where you make a choice. And that's what all those lines in the group uh, uh, table that has uh, all, all of the, um, I'm going to get this thing up to speed here, all of those uh, different subgroups of each one of these uh, groups uh, that's what those lines really are going to be useful for, is to keep track uh, from each one of them. How many different, really different kinds of irreducible representations can you have? I, I didn't say it loud enough, is those numbers we just quoted are invariant numbers. All the characters, the rank, the order of the group, right, and the number of, uh, of totally commuting operators. All those are numbers that are invariant to choices that you make. They come with a group. They could be inscribed in gold in a table in a library, okay? But everything else from here on is irreducible representations are completely up for grabs depending on what subgroup, chain, that's what these uh, lines are following there, 
uh, you pick, you see. So this is why the top-down procedure is sort of doomed to failure. Because it doesn't know about all of the real structure that's inside the group until it goes through uh, 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 exercises like we're doing right now. Okay, so uh, we have to uh, make a connection uh, between uh, that. That is, we've got to write the um, <coughs> numbers associated uh, with uh, D3's representations in terms of odd and even. And that's pretty easy to do. The, the uh, numbers that come out uh, of this representation and this one, for this one it's pretty obviously 1. Okay, if I'm looking at these two numbers right here, that, that's the two numbers, right? And then for this, this guy right here, I'm looking at these two things. So this one has got one of those. But then this guy's kind of weird. He's got zero here and two there. Well, if I add that and that, I get two. And I add that and that, I get zero. So I know that inside E there exists both a symmetric and an anti-symmetric. So this is a correlation table uh, uh, that we're going to uh, uh, work and read both ways eventually, but right now we're going to read it the usual way. Okay, so that, that's what we need, and that's what I'm going to rewrite that. Okay, now remember um, this um, rank, this rank, which is the sum of the dimensions, uh, that's four. So the question is, when we actually try to split this uh, item potent right here, it's pretty clear it's mm -hmm. going to split, mm -hmm. and it's going to split into a 0, 2, and a 1, 2. That's what we're seeing right there. Okay? And once we do that, once we do that, we can see that we're done, because we've already got these two item potents that do not split. This doesn't split, this doesn't split, this one does. So I'm going to get a new item potent. Besides the ones we've got, we've got three right now, and one of them is going to split. That's going to give us four. That's the rank of the group. So you know you're done after this happens. Okay? And this table turns into this. This one's going to be labeled 0, 0. This one's going to be labeled 1, 1, mod 2. And this guy is going to be labeled with 0, 0 plus a knight opponent that's labeled 1, 1. So this is where uh, it finally happens. We are now in a position to completely reduce the uh, elements of this group uh, to irreducible representations uh, of the uh, things. These are going to be irreducible projectors. These already were, but these two right here, these are the new guys in town. Zero, zero, and one, one. Gotten by multiplying a projector, zero, two, and one, two. So we got to multiply uh, PE, that's our old friend right here, by plus and minus symmetric and anti-symmetric I3 projector. Bingo. So as far as getting item potents, that's as far as this goes. Rank formula says, I can't split those anymore. I got four, that's it. Okay, so now, the th after this second stage uh, uh, gets us the projectors, we can go ahead and uh, look at what happens uh, uh, to the uh, uh, thing. Before we do that, I would like to look at the moving one. Here's the other main choice you could do. Instead of picking C2 to be diagonal, let's uh, look at our long lost friends here that rotate by 120, that have a C3 subgroup in there. Uh, repertoire. And that means we've got uh, moving waves over here, you know, the color green. We still have one standing wave that has a stoplight red, but the, so, uh, the uh, go light green is the uh, uh, one that we need to work with because that's going to be a splitting uh, of the uh, projection operator. A completely different kind of splitting. E and E again is going to split into these two, 1 mod 3 and minus 1 mod 3. Okay, so these are moving waves, actual angular momentum instead of being standing waves like this. So here's where we're going to get a set of moving wave representations out of uh, what we had from our character table and uh, all commuting item potents. 
So here's a C3 friendly set of projectors. I have to take that, each one of the projectors, and multiply them, but I don't really have to do it because this tells me what the answer is except for that one, and that's the one I multiply out, and I get uh, 1 mod 3 and minus 1 mod 3 projectors uh, uh, from that, and uh, there they are. Now these guys are complex. These are still real. They're just the same as the ones over here. But this is different, you see. So these are green projectors. They move. These guys are stuck in the mud, either symmetrically or anti-symmetrically. So they're completely different physics. This is Zeeman physics. This is Stark physics. And Stark, Stark was a uh, member of the Nazi party. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, Dr. Hunter, if you look at the table on the left, uh, top left here, that uh, yeah. So the first column, uh, one one, and you have two. Uh, the last column, one minus one, you have zero. The last. So yes. is it just? Uh, but the middle column, you have one one one. Remember, this is the trace of the representations oh. that we're trying to get. Oh, okay. Right. These are characters. Characters are trace of the irreducible representation. So mm -hmm. this particular set of of elements, each one of them. It's going to have zero trace. And we, were, we saw that. Remember we had a, a half and a minus half on the E? Comes to zero. So here we're getting that another way. Does that, that make what you're asking? Good. Anything else? Okay. All right. Now this is interesting too, but it's a little, uh, little side that, that uh, I should throw at you so you don't... Uh, uh, get surprised later on. I want to show you that now that we've got this thing down to four projectors, we also get the classes to split in a funny way. It used to be we had three classes, but now these guys are going to split, so we get four. The eyes, they're going to split. The uh, three is going to be special. These two, they're going to be like each other, but different from the I3. This is, you know, sort of. Uh, what um, a dictator would do in a country tries to get everybody fighting with everybody, tries to split people up. And this dictator right here has just gotten one and two to beat up on three. <laughs> okay, poor analogy, but it's it's still. And over here, R1 and R2 used to be the same class. They're not going to be in the same class. Okay? In both cases, you get four of these subclasses. But we have to have that because, you see, uh, I'm going to be writing energy formulas here in terms of parameters, which is what those are. I'm going to have four really independent parameters in either case here uh, for doing uh, an energy. That's the thing I wanted you uh, to see. So our local symmetry, C3, is going to have four parameters. R1 and R2 are free. Over here, I3 is a free parameter. I1 and I2 are dependent on each other. So are R1 and R2. Okay? They're going to have to be equal if you want to play this game right here. But if you want to play this game over here, you make all the I's equal because they're around in a circle, and R1 and R2 can be different. So th this is really where you see what sort of parameters can go into this D3 symmetry and still work with the given uh, splittings that we've already done? Okay, third stage, and we've got time to do this, I think. Third stage is the spectral resolution of the whole shebang. All six of the D3 elements need to be expressed in terms of P operators of some kind. Now, they're not going to be idempotent. If I could write this thing as a sum of idempotents, idempotents compute, commute with each other. These guys commute with each other, uh, uh, sort of. Okay? The idea here is uh, that I'm going to need some new kind of operator, maybe two of them actually, uh, to finish the job here. Because we got six dimensions in this D3 group. So far, I've only come up with four idempotents. I'm missing two somethings. And right? they can't be idempotents. And they can't be idempotents. If they were, the group would be abelian. And the algebra associated with it, the same. 
we would have all come in, we'd be back to doing the ordinary kind of Fourier analysis instead of this uh, extraordinary Fourier analysis. So what I do is I just do the old g equals 1 times g times 1 trick. <laughs> this is 1. And there it is again. Okay, I'm going to do this. That's the trick. Okay? Well, a lot of them are zero. Okay. That's because they're the all commuting item poles, these two guys right here. So the first two rows have a lot of zeros. Those are all zero, that's all zero right here. I'm left uh, here with item poles on a diagonal, but I got some stuff that's off the diagonal, like this array of a sum that I get uh, for this thing. Okay. And that's because this item potent here cannot commute through all of the G's. If it could, it could go through and kill that one. See, the X there is going to hit a Y. That would kill it. And the same thing here, the Y would hit an X. But it can't get through that G in general. It can only do it uh, for a couple of elements, like the unit. And, for, uh, well, there's no point discussing what, what uh, uh, it uh, does. Okay. So, what we're going to be uh, faced with here, and this is stuff that we'll detail more, more clearly in uh, the next uh, uh, lecture, but each of these guys right here, where I have um, xx here, then I get a pxx. And where I have a y here, I get a pyx. I have to define some new quantities. Now, these guys uh, right here, these are all commuting. So this guy goes right through and runs into this one and just gives itself again. So whatever number I get uh, for G operating on it, that's the uh, irreducible representation A1. Well, this number is always 1. We already know that. And this one is 1 or minus 1, depending on what G is on the front side or the back side of the group. All the I's uh, give you a minus 1 uh, for this. So this is just like ordinary abelian uh, algebra. This is the new guy in town right here. I'm going to get four numbers uh, here in general. I'm going to get well, the yx, the y, and I'm going to, I mean, I could do it uh, with these things uh, reversed. This is y, y, x, x. I can also get an x, x, y, y. Here they are. That's what we're interested in right there. So we have to m multiply those guys out. That's the... Uh, you know, where the, uh, we have finally then reduced this thing to a linear combination of one, two, three, four item potents plus two nil potents. These guys are numbers, are, are operators that when you square them, they become zero. That's the nil. It's not, they're, they're not impotents, they're nil potents. Okay, that is, they kill themselves, suicidal. Whereas these guys, you square them and they get the, they give themselves back again. Item potent gives back uh, when you square. Okay, so this guy and that guy, uh, this guy times that guy, that gives me an item potent. Or if I go flip it around, put this one on the other side, I get the x uh, item potent. So. The, that's what they do. What we've made is a simple matrix algebra. And that is something we'll have to celebrate that later. But that's basically what you're, you're seeing there. So I've got a number here, a number here, a number here, and a number here. That's four numbers for an irreducible representation of the E type. Then I'm going to have plus or minus one here, and I'm going to have always one uh, here. And that's going to expand every single group uh, operator in this group. There's six of them. We're done. And once that happens, okay. So here's what the numbers are after you've done uh, some multiplication, and we'll come back and do this a slightly different way, where the numbers carry are carried through. But basically, when you go through and put the numbers in, and as I say, you can look ahead and see how that that goes if you want to uh, get ahead of us a little bit here. But um, the, the, what I'm doing now is I am producing the eigenvectors. Uh, that will play with each other for the E's. That is, I'm giving you a 2 by 2 matrix uh, set uh, for each of these 
uh, operators. Now, the uh, formula that we still have to um, really derive and complete this in a, uh, shall we say, uh, 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 theoretically, but also the uh, formalistically uh, perfect uh, description is to fill in the numbers that go when I write a projection operator in terms of a group operator. We already have this. And this is just because these things are uh, matrices with all zeros everywhere except uh, some ones uh, along the diagonal or just off the diagonal. And so they, these are like the diodes, the kept bras of a matrix that's called the irreducible representation of this group. So you can see that the top-down procedure that, that uh, uh, has a bit of algebra at this point to do to fill in these numbers, which gives us these th uh, six matrices, the unit matrix, the cosine, cosine, minus sine, sine of 120 degrees, which is this, and the same thing here except with a minus sign down here instead of up here, cosine, cosine of 120 uh, degrees, and then the 180 degree rotations around different directions well, one of them just gives one minus one because we picked I3 to be diagonal and it's coming out that way. And then these guys, of course, can't be diagonal if that's the case. But that's the choice we made uh, for the standing waves, the stark approach uh, to uh, irreducible representations. So all these numbers give this if you're careful with your, your uh, uh, bookkeeping. And that's... Uh, pretty much solving the problem. But what's the physics of this? This is what's really cool. It's because we're taking these new kinds of projectors that may have um, may have uh, different numbers. That is, this number can be different from this number. It doesn't have to be an idempotent. It can be a nilpotent. Those nilpotents are useful uh, that we're getting here. But no more than that, if uh, all of our states are written as a projection of just the original, the identity state, whatever we call our origin, our tunneling origin, which is right there, uh, then uh, I can just go through these columns. I can go A1 here, or A2 here, or more interesting, E here, and that's what we're going to be looking at uh, right in the middle here. This is an EYY, this is an EXY, Okay, this is an EXX, this is an EYX. Gotten by projectors that are nilpotent and idempotent that come out of what we just did. Now, that state right there, for example, is going to have eigenvalues of I3 bar. I3 bar is the uh, uh, element of the inside, the local bod symmetry. Just plain old I3, this guy right here, is the global, uh, is a global operation. His partner, inside partner, is I bar 3. And I bar 3 comes up to this projector, says, yeah, yeah, I'm coming in, I've got security, I've got a security clearance. This guy can't get through there, you see, he doesn't commute with that one. But here, he's got security clearance, so he can go through and sit there on I3 times 1. But what he does is he turns around and he uh, operates on the projector. The projector then gives him a B quantum number right here. So odd or even, depending on what this is. So the, the deal is here that you have the global and local symmetry characterized by the two indices. The global's on the left. That's uh, what this one is giving here. He determines whether this number here is an X or a Y. And then the B goes through and it determines whether the other number here is an X or a Y. And so that's what we've got. Now what does that mean? I3 global anti-symmetry, uh, Y. Y uh, is the anti-symmetric, okay? And you can see that's uh, 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 true. If I do I3 here, okay, it changes from plus to minus. These are little wave functions that represent these uh, these vectors that we have. And uh, this one too, this one you see, if I go with I3, that's a rotate, I rotate this into 
to, to that is, is a minus sign. I rotate this thing, it's a minus sign. So this is globally anti-symmetric. But he's also locally anti-symmetric. He's got a Y in the local slot as well. Okay? I go local, I go local, I go local. Every time I get a minus sign which corresponds to the anti-symmetry of the uh, Y uh, index. So the I3 local Y anti-symmetry uh, is uh, indicated here uh, <clears throat> with the, uh, the red right-hand index. This is anti-symmetry. This one is anti-symmetric. See, it's two, got two uh, things with a node between them that have opposite parity. It's got nothing there, and that's really interesting. And this one also has nothing right there. And that's because you're trying to get both symmetric and anti-symmetric symmetry at the home base. Can't do that. You're not going to get anything there. You know the wave function is not going to be there from, from that one. Okay. Anyway, the local X symmetry of this one is very obvious, this one very obvious, this one very obvious, and uh, each one of these uh, uh, here, this and this, are minus and minus, plus and plus. So lo local symmetry and uh, for uh, this one, the global symmetry is also in effect. Global and local, this one is anti-local and global. Then there's this guy down here. He's just symmetric in every way possible. And this one is anti-symmetric in every way possible. So that's it in a nutshell is what we've got here. Is a really neat way to look at the uh, wave functions which are showing, uh, a particular one of them is showing uh, on the uh, screen there. So this is important here. Global versus local. This one has global symmetry but it's completely screwed its local symmetry, okay? This one has local symmetry, but it's completely screwed the global. Okay. This one has both local and global symmetry. Okay. All right. Now, um, this is where it, the numerical part of this uh, uh, pays off, is we now take this uh, matrix, actually figure out what uh, the Hamiltonian looks like in terms of those parameters. We have a formula, we have a closed form formula for all the possible parameters that we can have. We've only got rank four here, so I've only got four parameters going for me here. And this is, this re as I say, this requires a, a very rigorous uh, global versus local calculus, which goes through and sums the thing in an orderly fashion instead of just sort of splotting them out uh, like that. But that is uh, what we're uh, headed for uh, here. Now, here's the actual picture of the waves that are going over there. And that's just one of them. The, uh, the one that you see there, I think, is this one. Let's see, if I, it's this one. It's a pair of those. It's yeah. all on that same level. It's the uh, one that has a... Uh, uh, a, a local, I'm sorry, global uh, X symmetry, that's symmetric. Uh, and then it's got, yes. in, lo in a locality, it's anti-symmetric. You see the node in the middle there, plus and minus, but also here, plus and minus. Okay. Now here, it tries to do both. You see, it tries to have the anti-symmetry that it has a locality, but it's at the center axis uh, for the global. And so, uh, uh, so, to the extent that this thing cannot tunnel uh, uh, I3, um, you're going to get nothing here. But you don't quite, because it doesn't break uh, the kind of internal symmetry that we need for this to be perfect. This one has the same thing. It has a little tiny bit here. It's deeper down, so the, the tunneling I'm talking about that would break this isn't really doing much. So you have a, a global anti-symmetry, but you have symmetry everywhere. And here's an, uh, another one here. Uh, uh, <clears throat> this one has, um, try and make the local anti-symmetric. Here we make the local symmetric. So you get a big pile up inside where you didn't have anything uh, before. And then there's inside and out symmetric inside and out, anti-symmetric. 
pretty cool. I mean, this problem is filleted with Italian sauce. <laughs> what about if you have D4? Uh, D4. Uh -huh, D D4. D4 would be a square. Yeah. Yeah. That, but D4. Oh, um, this is D3, so. Yeah. Um, what you're thinking about is going one number up in the uh, dihedral uh, class of groups, right? Yeah. So. Uh, I'm going to let you answer that question okay. <laughs> because that's a good homework problem. If, you know, if you're, if you're doing, um, you know, some homework. He has assigned it in the past. Actually, it, it, it's probably an was. easier one because you don't get square roots of three all the time. You get square roots of four, which is two, and that makes the numbers a lot nicer. Okay, I think I will redo yeah. that homework problem. That, that's a, a worth worth redoing, and then you can yeah, sketch the waves you'd straight. get for four wells. Yeah. Right, and they're 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 very obvious uh, symmetry there because it's. Always plus and minus. I think that's assignment six, last problem. It could be, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. The other, the other thing that we'll be talking about, uh, here's where I say, where, remember how Gertrude Stein said something about? I think it was a, um, a, a town in California, Bakersfield. She said the trouble with Bakersfield is there's no there there. <laughs> well, that's what we're getting here. There's no there there. <laughs> when you talk about this or this, according to the symmetry, there's no there there. <laughs> and that's the, the, the conflict between global and local, which is, I think, a really beautiful uh, thing to, to use. And then when it doesn't happen, it really piles up where it originally didn't get there. We well, ought to do this, too, because we have to do some group theory of vibrations. And this is the ticket. Uh, not only that, but we have to be careful about how we uh, point our springs we can make them have a local symmetry, or we can make them not have it. So th th that's a mechanical problem that uses this, uh, this formalism. Okay, I think we're uh, finishing it at, at a pretty good time, and I, I think we might even have some battery yeah. uh, left. Definitely, uh, I see a so bar So if you have now. any questions, you can get it on film uh, right now. Otherwise, we'll turn it off and you can ask a question that's more private. These uh, uh, videos tend to get uh, dozens of views. <laughs> They're not like uh, the cat video, which gets 100 million. Uh, we're more like a dozen. We have a nice we're happy geo, with a dozen. geo spatial distribution. Yeah, uh, yeah we can get the statistics. Uh, yeah, you know, the wave function analytics. of the observation of this wave function course uh, is available just with a click of a button if you I, go on. I made an observation uh, that this group theory class gets more attention than is CM with a Bain class. It, it, more than the uh, classical. Yeah. yeah. Quantum gets more than it's classical. The classical. That's mechanism. interesting. It's a special case. It was non-intuitive. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, every time somebody views it, you get to, uh, you, do you get a click, something like that? How, how do you get to track the number of Views? Uh, there's so, Google so. Analytics. Uh, when you get your channel and set it up, there's a sidebar over there that says Analytics. Click on that and it'll collect it all up and display it for you. Oh, okay. You can plot it up geo, you know, not geopolitical, but geo geological. Geographical. Yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. Actually, it will be possible to do geo too because uh, it'll take IP numbers. We tried to do that on our own and it failed abysmally. But after a month, the data was corrupt. So now we're, we're hoping it's a little more trustworthy. Yeah. It's the, I, the internet service providers that sometimes gets noise or inaccuracies in the data, especially with VPNs now. And then don't forget, we're going to also have bots. Bots from the north. Hundreds, thousands, millions of them. That's the, that has really just come out this week. I haven't even heard that. Oh, you gotta, I don't know. You gotta, you gotta go to a news source that reports what's going on. <laughs> I was too busy working and getting this class prepared, but what, what sort of bot are you talking about? There. Is it BOT? It's uh, Putin bots is what they are. Ah, I did see a glimmer of that. 
it's not just this country, but we got the most. They spent a uh, million five hundred thousand every month for trying. for uh, sixteen months. They're, they're trying to exacerbate the issue down in Florida with the high school shooting. That's what I heard. Yep, read. they are doing that. That's one of their main active yeah. activities in the box. Now, incidentally, they were doing this for well over five years in the UK or in the EU. Every time they have an election. Russia sticks it in there again. Where is European Union? EU. EU. European Union. They they managed France. France is very smart. They said, okay, no advertisements. Uh, two three weeks before the election. Wow. None. Sweet. Yeah. Say something about donations yeah. too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh no, yeah. But they're not so. Uh, yeah, we have that one in India too. The moral code of conduct is enforced uh, before the election. Like you, certain things you can't do. Like uh, no policy announcement six months before the election to oh. influence the voters. Yeah, America no, does not do that. Oh, they'll have a fit. Yeah. All these analysts without jobs. God. Okay, we'll um, go ahead and uh, prepare for the next go around here. Let me uh, escape here. So what? What are we? Uh